illustration giving. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, and we're taking a look at this first illustration that Jesus gives us, that of giving. We're going to continue this message in just a moment, but if you have to leave early, or if you joined us late, or you just want to go back and listen to Jonathan's teaching again, you can always do that by coming to our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. You can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. You can also listen on the go if you have the Encounter the Truth app. It's free, and you'll find it at your favorite app store. Just simply look for Encounter the Truth. Let's get back to the message. Again, here is Jonathan. That's Jesus' first illustration, giving. His next one is prayer. Again, here Jesus has something to say about the religious hypocrites that he encountered in his day. They love to pray in public, verse 5, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners with the motivation that they should be seen by others. That was how the actors, the hypocrites, practiced their religion all around Jesus in his day. But true followers of Jesus are to take a very different approach. We're not to seek the praise of those around us, but we are to seek the reward of the unseen Father. It's been a kind of interesting exercise for me to reflect on the challenge of these verses for our context here. It's been interesting because the assumption that Jesus makes here in verse 5 is that we will be a praying people when you pray, he says, verse 5. And in some ways, I guess that assumption is even a little challenging because I'm not sure it's as much a part of our Christian living as it could be or perhaps should be. In 2014, the Pew Research Center for Religion and Public Life conducted a major survey on the prayer habit of adult Americans. They found out that across all participants in the survey, about 35,000 people, irrespective of their religious affiliation, about 55% of American adults pray on a daily basis. That covers Christians, Buddhists, atheists, everyone. What was interesting to me was that when they isolated the evangelical Protestants who had participated in the survey, that number went up only to 79%. 79% of evangelical Christians who took part in the survey said that they pray on a daily basis. Now, that's just a little food for thought. How much are you and I actually praying? Is that part and parcel of our daily lives, our daily walk with the Lord? As far as the audience of our prayer is concerned, Jesus' point here is not that public prayer, praying in a prayer meeting or a church service, his point is not that public prayer is always wrong in and of itself. The New Testament has plenty of examples of Christians praying as they gather together. No, his concern, again, is about our motivation, the state of our hearts as we pray. Are we wanting to be seen by others to win their praise and to win their approval, or are we wanting to be seen by the Father to receive his approval? I guess one healthy question to be asking ourselves here is whether our prayer life in private and before the Father is of as much substance as our prayer life before other Christians and in public. If we've been around Christian circles long enough, if we've been in the church long enough, we'll know how to make the right noises in a prayer meeting, won't we? We'll know how to pray in a plausible or spiritual or even impressive sounding way when we need to. But it would be quite possible for us once we've been around long enough to do that on occasion while having little or no private prayer life at all. If that's the case, we need to see the warning signs of that, the warning signs that we may be religious hypocrites, that we may be acting where there is no reality, and we may be receiving our reward now in the attention of those around us, but we should expect nothing from the Father. It's also worth asking ourselves how and why we might talk with one another about our private prayer life. It is something that we talk about, and rightly so. It is a major part of the Christian life after all, and we're all wanting to encourage one another along in the Christian life. But there is a danger that occasions when we talk about our prayer life become occasions where we seek praise or attention. So take the common scenario. I tell a fellow believer that I am praying for them at the moment. Now that can be a wonderful thing to do, and I'd actually encourage you to do that. But I need to check my motivation as I say that. Am I telling this brother or sister that I am praying for them so that they will be encouraged? That's a good reason. Or am I telling them so that they will be impressed and so that they will think I'm spiritual? Jesus' basic point here is that our praying must never be for show. 
must never be about impressing others. As with giving, we need to make sure, we need to be on our guard, that our focus is squarely on pleasing the Father and Him alone. But in the case of this second example of his points, in the case of prayer, Jesus goes a little bit further than he does in the case of the other two examples. He gives us a little bit more to chew on. And I guess he does that because prayer is so vital and is such a central part of our Christian living. And no doubt as well, he knew that it was something that we needed plenty of help with along the way. Alongside the hypocrite's temptation to pray in public to gain attention, another temptation, another danger zone, is that of wordiness and of repetition in prayer to try and impress God himself. Verse 7. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. With typical insight into the human heart, Jesus cuts straight to the heart of religious hypocrisy. He gets right into the mind of the actor who wants to appear impressive, both to onlookers and even to God himself. What does the hypocrite think will look impressive in prayer? Make it as public as possible, yes. But also make it as worthy. Make it as lengthy. Make it as flowery. Make it as intense as you can. And it is amazing how easily we fall into the same way of thinking. Surely the most spiritual, the most mature prayers are the long and the repetitive and the wordy prayers that seem to go on and on. Surely someone who prays like that in public, someone who has the endurance to keep praying on and on and on, surely it's that person who has the kind of inside track to God. And in response to that wrong-minded attitude, Jesus gives us, in verses 9 to 13, a model of a completely different kind of prayer, a model of prayer for the genuine believer who longs simply to speak to his Father, to speak to her Father, and to please him alone. Like so much that we're encountering here in the Sermon on the Mount in this series, this is another section, the Lord's Prayer, that we could really dig into and spend time on and do a sermon series of its own just on these verses. We're not going to do that now, of course, there isn't time. We're just going to notice the basic character and the emphasis of this prayer in passing. Remember, Jesus is giving us this prayer and this model of prayer primarily to illustrate his bigger point about religious hypocrisy. And so we want to think about this prayer just within that context. Just two things to notice in passing about the Lord's Prayer. First of all, it is radically God-centered as it begins. The prayer is first of all about God and not about us. God's name is to be hallowed, verse 9. That is, it's to be revered and feared, known as holy and treated as such. The prayer is for the kingdom to come. Verse 9, for God's kingship to be recognized and lived out in the lives of his people and then to be made manifest when the Lord returns. The prayer is for God's will to be done, his purposes to be accomplished. The prayer is first and foremost about God and centered on him, his reputation, his plans, and his purposes. I wonder if our praying is anything like that. But second, when it comes to us, we are simply to express our dependency on him for all our needs. We express our dependency on him for our physical needs. Verse 11, daily bread. We express our even deeper need for forgiveness. Verse 12, and for the Lord's help in the battle with sin. Verse 13, it's brief and simple because, of course, verse 8, your father knows what you need before you ask him. The prayer of the genuine believer is simple, not wordy. It is first and foremost God-centered before it is us focused. And where it turns to us, it expresses our dependency on the Father for our most basic and our most pressing needs. Simple, unadorned, no babbling, no repetition, no show. Whether you are a new believer just learning to pray or a veteran prayer warrior, what can you and I learn from this model of simplicity? in prayer. Finally, and very briefly, we come to Jesus' third illustration, the practice of fasting. This is perhaps the practice that feels furthest from our experience and maybe even least relevant. There is actually some debate within the church today as to whether fasting is really still part of New Testament practice. Although Israelites were required to fast under the Old Covenant, we're never commanded to fast anywhere in the New Testament. That's true. And certainly the requirement to fast as part of a religious calendar, that is gone. 
But at the same time, Jesus does seem to assume here that fasting will continue. He says here in verse 16, when you fast, as he said about the other practices. And there are instances in the New Testament where believers do fast. For instance, when selecting new church leaders in the book of Acts. It seems to be one special way of expressing our dependency on the Lord and of adding urgency to our prayers while also learning and exercising a new level of self-control. It's not something we talk about very much. It doesn't receive huge emphasis in the New Testament. But the fact that Jesus mentions it here perhaps means it's something we should consider at times of particular need and of intensive prayer. It's not commanded anywhere and it is certainly a matter between the believer and the Lord. Good and useful as fasting may be, as with other practices, it becomes another opportunity for the hypocrite to seek attention and to seek praise from other people. That's what Jesus saw in his own day. The hypocrites, verse 16, look somber and disfigure their faces to show men their fasting. And so Jesus' instruction to us once again is to ensure that this, like others, is a discreet and a private matter between the believer and the Lord. Verse 17, put oil on your head and wash your face. Look bright, look alert, look fresh, so that it will not be obvious to men that you're fasting, but only to the Father who is unseen. Where are you and I in danger, even today, of practicing our righteousness before an earthly audience, before others, seeking their praise, seeking their approval? Is our danger zone our Christian service? Our study of the word, is it giving? Is it prayer? Is it fasting? Or is it something else? In each of those things, as in every area of our devotion to the Lord and our obedience to him, the remedy is to keep it discreet, to be intentional about that, to avoid practicing it for others to see. And the reason is both simple and very wonderful. The Lord who sees everything, our Father in heaven, delights to reward those who seek his favor and his approval. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth and a message called Invisible Religion. Part of our series on the Sermon on the Mount, we're calling God's Blueprint for a New Society. And if you miss any broadcast in the series, come to the website and listen online. Just come to EncounterTheTruth.org. And while you're there, I want to ask you to consider giving a gift to support, because that's how we're able to keep Jonathan's teaching on this station. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to say thank you by sending you a book written by Elizabeth Elliot. It's called Through Gates of Splendor. It's the story of five young men, including Elizabeth's husband, Jim, who traveled into the jungles of Ecuador, died at the end of a spear, and ended up beginning a missionary movement. We'd love to send you a copy of this book. Again, it's called Through Gates of Splendor, as you give a gift of any amount this month. You can find out more or give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. Again, our website is EncounterTheTruth.org and the phone number is 833-998-7884. Well, thanks for listening today, and I hope you'll join us next time. The Restoration Station, 770 KAAM. It's time for Wonderful Words of Life with Nella Phillips. Have you seen Moments with Nella on YouTube.com? These are one-minute videos you don't want to miss. These biblically-based inspirational moments will brighten your day and bring you a chuckle or two along the way. Then be sure to click on subscribe. There's absolutely no charge to you or your pocketbook. And if you click on the bell, you'll be notified when a new video is posted. That's Moments with Nella on YouTube. Com. Here's Nella. As a child, did you receive an allowance? If so, did it seem to you as though it were never quite enough? So then, because you had your eye on that special toy train in the store window, did you decide to do additional chores to earn that needed extra money? If so, bravo! Working to earn is good because it helps the person appreciate the value of a dollar. But what about the one who feels he'll never have enough? No matter how much he has, he desires even more. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10, whoever loves money never has money enough. And we can add our own thoughts to that. Not only will the lover of money never have enough, he will never be satisfied with what he does have, nor lead a satisfying life. 
So W.L. Hudson has for us an appropriate thought for the day. He says, the love of wealth makes better men. The love of God makes better men. Don't forget to watch and subscribe to Moments with Nella on YouTube. You'll be glad you did. That's Moments with Nella. And don't forget, when you subscribe, there's no charge. If we fast forward now to your sitting here today, and uh, you came here in a wheelchair, and uh, yet God is using you all across the country. He is blessing your book, and he is uh, using the message that you deliver, a message of hope message of worth, a message of God's love, and especially an understanding of Jesus Christ and how he can take us in the darkest moments of our lives and put an arm around us and tell us that he loves us and uh, somehow make triumph out of tragedy. You are an example of that. You are exhibit A in the work that he does in our lives. Family Talk with Dr. James Dobson, 7.30 a.m. and 5 p.m. Weekdays on 770 KAAM. This is Aaron Budgen of Living God Ministries. The revelation of Jesus is a beautiful picture, but if you feel like you have a bunch of Bible pieces that don't fit together, listen to the broadcast of Living God Ministries on this station, KAAM, Monday through Friday from 6 to 6.30 p.m., or listen through our free radio archive at livinggodministries.net, and I will show you how the pieces fit together. Many Christians admit end-time Bible prophecy is complex and difficult to understand. But what if you could understand Bible prophecy and know what will happen during the end time? You can. Listen to the End Time Show with Dave Robbins, Ben Stegall, and Doug Bell to gain peace and understanding about what the Bible says concerning end time prophecy. You can hear the End Time Show weekdays at 3 p.m. on 770 AAM. A dog? I'm not. I was born for a purpose, to bring you hope, to guide you out of darkness. When past battles cloud your mind, I push them away. You tell me I'm your hero, just as you are mine. A dog? I'm not. With me, you see the world again. Learn more at dogthink.org. Hey drivers, it's Ryan Blaney, your 2023 NASCAR Cup Series champion and driver of the number 12 discount tire Ford Mustang. Do you know one of the most important things that helps keep my car going on the track? Tire pressure. Keeping your tires properly inflated is crucial for safe stopping power and better gas mileage. Check your tire pressure at least once a month or stop by a local tire retailer for an air check. A message from the U.S. Tire Manufacturers Association. Do remember that you can get in touch with Leading the Way by calling us, 800-337-5323, or at ltw.org. Join with Dr. Youssef and the Open Door Campaign to expand the reach of the gospel through Leading the Way. In the Old Testament book of Judges, Practical Words for Life Today, here now is Dr. Michael Youssef. I don't think I'm exaggerating if I tell you that this series of messages that I'm beginning today is the most important and practical series of messages that I've ever preached. I want to tell you why. Today, as I look at our world, as I look at our culture, as I look at the church in general, I see it to be a mirror image 
of what had happened during the period of the Book of Judges. Before our own eyes, we are seeing how this generation is running away from biblical foundation. Culturally, we're no longer looking to answers in the Word of God. Educationally, we no longer take the Bible seriously. Historically, we are reinterpreting history so that the great heroes of yesteryears, now they are villains. Churches that had believed and proclaimed the very soul, the very heart, the very essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ, namely that Jesus and Jesus alone saves. Now, statistic after statistic tell us that 60% of so-called Christians believe that Jesus is not the only way. And the prediction is that this trend continues, if the number will go to 90% of those who name the name of Christ will no longer believe the very heart of the Christian faith, the very soul of the Christian faith. And that is why you and I must be intentional in reversing this trend. We must begin by repenting of our own sins and our apathy and our indifference. We must begin by interceding for the next generation. We must lovingly reach out to the next generation. We must diligently instruct the next generation. We must spiritually nurture the next generation. And that is why the book of Judges is a serious warning for every one of us. This is a serious warning for us as a culture and as a society. This is a serious warning for what could happen if we do not diligently intercede for the next generation. If we don't intentionally, if we don't devotedly and deliberately equip the next generation with the truth. The result is going to be what Paul warned us about in Romans chapter 1. That God will give them over to the full repercussion of their sins. Now beloved, please listen to me. When God's absolutes give way to relativism, when God's truth is exchanged for false tolerance, then soon we will slide from disillusionment to despair to ultimate disintegration. This particular period in the life of Israel and the history of Israel during the book of Judges, the Judges generation grew up not knowing or believing in the God of Joshua. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute. But here's what you must understand about that period. Because when you read it and you think this was a whole departure from God. No, 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 it was not. In fact, Israel never ceased to be religious. Israel never ceased to be doing charitable work. Israel never ceased from going through the motion of religion. Israel never ceased the religious activities. Israel never ceased from going to church. Ah, but they just squeezed the truth of who God is to the margins of life. Oh, they did not deny Yahweh, they did not deny God, and they did not deny Him place in society, they just denied Him the central place. They just liked the Canaanites a little bit too much. Ah, uh, the Canaanites, aren't they nice people? I mean, surely. So instead of eliminating them, as God told them to, they cozy it up to them. They went on vacation with them. Instead of claiming them, they incorporated some of their religious practices into theirs. In other words, the people of God have become canonized. Can you see it in the church? I want to tell you something about our most importance. Please listen carefully. The seeds of Israel's declining began with a spiritual compromise. Can you see it? In the churches. Can you see it in our lives? Oh, well, these Canaanites, they're so nice. They're the nice people. Who wouldn't want to intermarry with them? Oh, these Canaanites, they just have their own religious views and 
And who wouldn't be open-minded to their practices and what they do? Who wouldn't be understanding? Who would ever commit the sin of intolerance? These kind of nights, oh, they are lovable, my goodness. They just have their own sexual preferences. So let's ordain them and make them bishops in the church. Well, how else would we prove to the world that we are tolerant people? How else would we prove to the world <laughs> that we are not bigoted at all? And beloved, once the moral lines become blurred, Christ is dethroned. And once Christ becomes just a way, not the way, moral relativism will follow. Once Christianity is just another religion, the seeds of destruction have already been set in. And if the book of Judges is going to be teaching us anything, it was going to be teaching us that we must never give an inch, that we must never concede one of our children, that we must not settle for partial victories, that we must not give up our birthrights, that we must not surrender our children, that we must not think that their departure from the truth is inevitable, that we must contend for every soul, that we must fight for every one of our children and the children's children. We must stand firm regardless of the cost, that we must lovingly but firmly hold them to our inheritance. Amen, belongs to you. For the Bible tells us that the children are heritage of the Lord. They're not ours, they're His. And it's our stewardship to see to it that we train them in the battle. You know the most amazing thing about the devil is? He's not very creative. He really is not. I mean, he doesn't come up with new ideas or this and that. I mean, he, he really is not. If you study the Bible, if you, if you watch the history, and if you study history, if you deal with the rascal, <laughs> as I do, he's not creative. He has only one trick up his sleeve, and he uses it over and over and over and over again. Oh, to be sure, he dresses it up differently for every generation, so they think it's a new idea. But it's not. I want you to hear me right, please. Just as the devil succeeded in deceiving the judge's generation by convincing them that you can have Yahweh and you have the fertility gods as well, he is deceiving this generation that they can have Jesus and evolution as well. Please listen to me. Once you accept evolution as a fact, it will not take very long before Jesus, the creator and the sustainer of the universe, be lost in the shuffle. Why do you think these secular forces are becoming more and more militant about it? The devil is fighting for the souls of our children. And that is why we must teach them the art of spiritual battle. We must allow them to watch us how we do spiritual battle in spiritual warfare. Don't just give them good education and a whole lot of money and pat in the back. Equip them with the authority of the Word of God. Prepare them for the battle. Don't just settle for them to succeed in business and succeed in the world. Teach them how to battle the enemy of God. Cry to God on their behalf. Be a role model so they can watch you and know how to stand in the battle. But there's something else that the book of Judges teaches us here, and it's the most encouraging part of the book. It teaches us the incredible, relentless grace of God. The incredibly relentless grace of God. Over and over and over, He delivers them again and again and again and again. And that is the greatest encouragement that we're going to see from the book of Judges, the faithfulness of God. And it'll be an encouragement to all of us who are and continue to cry to the Lord and call on him as the God of grace. Because he is not only the God of grace, he is the God who does not give up. He is the God who never lets us down. He is the God who never lets us go. In fact, the book of Judges 
picks up historically where the book of Joshua left off. Joshua left the people of Israel, the people of God. He left them with a real vision of who God is. He left them with a vision of future possibilities. And if you want to read more about Joshua, you can get my book. You want me to do what? And now we'll tell you all about Joshua and his vision and how he left legacy to the people of God. And here's what Joshua said to them. He said, if you obey the Lord your God, he's going to fight your battles for you. We can start today because when spiritual amnesia sets in, trust me when I tell you, compromise will must surely follow. Talk about generational gap. This is it. Well, Listen to me. Before yeah. I blame anybody, I always look in the mirror. Because, beloved, I want to tell you, not that my generation let down the next generation, but those of us who are standing in these pulpits have let down the next generation. We have ceased to proclaim, thus says the Lord. We want to make people feel good so they can come back. We don't want to hurt their feelings. We don't want to tell them to repent. We don't want to call sin, sin. And consequently, the next generation do not know what a sin is. 